Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. What we're doing is, is we, as uh, most of you know, we started last week a series called Come and Follow Me as I Follow Christ, the Come and Follow Me series. And the reason for this, there's a couple verses I want to bring out. It says, uh, the Apostle Paul said, uh, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. And then uh, Paul, speaking of his uh, spiritual son Timothy, therefore I urge you to imitate me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son, and whom, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord, and he reminds you of my way. He didn't say James is his way, or Peter's way, or Jude's way. He reminds you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. And what we've been talking about is, uh, you know, Peter had an awesome ministry. James had an awesome ministry. Paul had an awesome ministry. There's amazing ministries that are taking place in, in, in New England, uh, let alone across the rest of the country and the world. I, I think Bill Johnson's doing a great job. Certain, certainly Raymond, the Hagans are doing a great job. And, and certainly they're all glorifying the Lord. But we like to use the term here. There's, there's flavors. There's emphasis. There's, there's messages that certainly the scriptures, there's not a lot of leeway as far as what we get to do doctrinally, but there are certainly those ministries and ministers that are given certain things to emphasize. For example, uh, Billy Graham, I'm not going to go, to go, I wouldn't have gone necessarily to a Billy Graham crusade to listen to a five-week series on prosperity. But, I, but the grace that was on him, I'll tell you what, if that's what I needed and I needed someone to come to Christ, we're going to get over there. So, And if you are part of that ministry, you have that flavor. It's not better, it's not worse. It's like saying a finger is more or less of the body than the heart or the shoulder. It's not. Well, the reason for it, and bringing it back to this, is going into this year, um, going into 2020, I had a really good conversation with someone yesterday, and we were talking about the importance of identity. You know, it's okay to have a particular identity, and that doesn't make you better or worse than anybody else. We talked also about last week, we had said even the seven churches in Asia had different flavors. They had the church that you would have thought in, in, in ancient history, the Ephesians church was massive. It was a big church. And yet the Ephesians church, from the outside, we'd look at this thing like it was rocking and rolling, and Jesus said, you left what I first called you to do, and if you don't knock it off, I'm yanking your candlestick from you. So many times what's on the outside that looks successful is not necessarily right, and so the Lord addressed each ministry based on what it was that they were, that, that they were doing. And so going into uh, 2020, and uh, as most of you know, the, the Lord, I, I made a commitment to fly for at minimum X amount of time. I'm not going anywhere for a long time. We're not going to plant churches. We're not going to do a lot of things. So I said that to say we've got a big bunch of time to really build on the foundations of GHCC and to really embed into our hearts, again, our identity as an Antioch-modeled church that's gifted plants churches and has influence. And uh, during the past year, year and a half, uh, we had some things happen that we that made it clear we're just our foundations weren't quite as deep as they were that they were supposed to be. So okay, let's get to work on it. And so going into this series, going into 2020, you know, when how many of y'all have a, a, a junk drawer in your, in your kitchen? You open up, you know, man, that's where the screwdriver is. That's where the duct tape is. That's where the... Well, there are things that are in my spirit, certainly uh, through almost 30 years of ministry, there's tons of stuff you can teach, but, but there's, there's the go-to stuff. 
Like for Kenneth Hagin, the go-to, he could teach on a lot of things, is Mark 11, 23, 24. I wonder if we're going to see that verse again today. Okay, soon. Well, there's go-to things, there's identity, there are graces, not all of them, but there are particular graces that GHCC is adding to this area with all the other ministries. And it was on my heart to shore some things up and bring uh, some things together to start the series. So, and last week, as a quick review, we, we, you, we had to start. And if you, don't get, if, if you don't get, this is one of those things, if you don't get this, you won't get me. And the first message was the crucified life. There's not, in my, from, in my opinion, and again, look, I'm as, I'm as prosperity believing as anybody you're ever going to, you're ever going to run into. I wouldn't be driving around in jets again and cars and how, I wouldn't have that if I didn't believe in the blessings of God. But it resurrected Style, uh, resurrection life is the result of a crucifixion, and I'm convinced we've caused problems in the body of Christ trying to teach a resurrected life without taking people to the cross. And Jesus said this, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, anyone, like, if he's going to the cross, you're going to go to a cross. And you got one that's all your own. He says, if anybody's going to come after me, you are going to take up your cross. You are going to deny yourself. And then it starts, starting there, okay, we can get some work done. And I've shared with you this uh, story before. I remember years and years ago when I first came to Christ, um, you know, and I, was, I wanted to be a studio musician. I wanted to be a rock star God and be amazing. I, man, I was, man that was, I was at it. I was pounding it out, pounding it out, just playing and playing and playing. I actually started to play again, too, and it's feeling really, really good. Callus is starting to develop and stuff. And, but I remember talking to the Lord about it, and I could feel this tug in my heart that this isn't what he... I was going to have to start giving up stuff, you know, the cross. And uh, listen, you know, cross is at first until you understand what God's thinking when he makes you go there, it, it can hurt. And I remember saying, I was like, well, all this Christian music I can make for you and I want to play for you and I want to... And he came back to me and he says, well, what if that's not what I want you to do for me? And see, without the cross, you'll think you're doing something for God when we understand now in union with him, and we really hit this one, and, and this was one of those keepers. Our bodies, our cells, we are not alive for self-discovery. We're alive for divine discovery. That there's nothing God creates to be independent of Him. It doesn't, there's, it doesn't exist unless you're on your way to hell. Because that's why you go to hell. You're not going to hell based on your actions. You go because your faucet was turned off based on original sin and you never got the faucet turned back on through the new birth. That's why. And what happens is when we come into Christ, and, and this will we'll end the review because i got some really good stuff to talk about. If you remember, there was a word that I used to, to, to try to help you understand the crucified life and why it's so important. And the word I used was exchange. That the, when we, when so many folks, we have this image of the, of, of the cross and carrying our cross, we equate it to torture when if we if we get our minds and wrap it around the principle of exchange, when I lose my life into Him, I'm exchanging who I am, and I'll just sum it up with this: Look, I'd rather have Jesus than me. I'd rather have Jesus than me. I've seen my best. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus than me. Am I the only one in here that would rather have? I've seen your best, all right? Trust me, we want you to have Jesus, okay? So uh, we had a great time last week, and so now, going into this week, part two of what we're going to, uh, uh, that just really so embedded in my heart, things that uh, it's so important that we bring uh, here to New England, uh, is the spirit of of faith, the spirit of faith. Now, I wrote down a couple of uh, uh, scriptures here, and I want you to consider for a second why we're going to start here. Matthew 6, 7, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, the scriptures say, thus making void the word of God by your tradition 
that you have handed down and many such things that you do. Now, let me ask you this. What, what do you think? Is there, can you see a commonality in these two verses? Can you see something that's in common that, that the Lord's uh, uh, addressing? And I'll let you, a couple of you raise your hand if you want. What, what's a commonality that you see in these two verses? Right? One or two. Ma, what would you say? Okay, tradition is one, certainly. Uh, anything else? I might let even three hands. Roger? Repetition. Okay, repetition is another one. One more. Take one more guess. Uh, Tony? Rituals. Okay, rituals is another one. Uh, those are close, but the reason why, and this is kind of, it's not necessarily clickbait, but I want to present a case. I want what I'm about to say is to get you to re- really, really be interested in what I'm about to teach you for the next 30 to 40 minutes. What these two things have in common is you can be doing religious activity, even including prayer, and nothing is getting done. You can be doing religion. You can even be talking or thinking you're talking to God, and we're, fine, we're seeing here that you can be doing things even in God's name, but nothing's getting done. Now, I'm probably the only one in this room that has ever wondered why is nothing getting done. Okay, so I, I know that's not you guys. So what I'll do is I'll just, I'm going to preach to me for the next half hour, 40 minutes. And, and, and if you think maybe you might run into being ineffective at some point, just take some notes because one day you might run into some things that aren't working out. And this might be an important message. Notice here, especially the first one, when you pray, that there is a way, and trust me, there's tons of ways you can pray that the Lord's really not happy with how you're praying. You can be actively doing things. See, what we do is, is and, and you've heard me say regularly here, the scriptures say faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The rhema, the word of God, right? So faith re- is a result of, of hearing God's words, understanding what it is that he means, and then you, your spirit, just like my muscles, grab this, your spirit grabs a hold of the promise of God and holds on to it until we see it come to pass, and we're going to learn about because we believe we've received, right? All right, well, what we, what we understand is, is that just because we're saying something, just because we're doing something, just because we're active in something, if faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, that means genuine God-moving faith must depend on you know what it is, what He meant when He said what He said. And listen to this. You've got to get this in your head. The Lord is gracious but he's under no obligation to do what you want him to do just because you want him to do it. He's obligated himself to his word, not your wishes. I'll say that again. God has obligated himself to his words, not your wishes. And what happens is, is we, we, we expect because we're sincere, someone who's praying relentlessly may be sincere. I may sincerely think I can fly when I jump off the Empire State Building, but if I violate laws, gravity is under no obligation to put itself on hold so I can float. And if we can get past in our minds that the Scriptures as spiritual technology, are given to us to be schooled in how God does things. Ignorance may be an excuse when you first come to Christ, but the the writer of Hebrews said, by this time you ought to be teaching this stuff. But because you have not, through reason of use, exercised yourselves and your ability to discern right and wrong and good and evil, is that you're just like babies again. Spiritual maturity is not necessarily dependent on natural chronological age, but the Word of God has been given to us. Listen, there's amazing churches. We're an amazing church. There's amazing churches where after one, two, three, five years, there really is no excuse not to be able to move on into the things of God. Kenneth Hagin would say this. He'd say, you ought to be able to take what I've learned and taught, and within five years after you've prayed it out and practiced some of these things, you ought to be able to go and do those things yourself. So as we get started, it's important that we understand one last time. And I, I want to challenge you. I want to get in your head. Don't be afraid to acknowledge if you've got some things that aren't working out right, that you don't know. That's where your, that's where your answers are going to start coming is when you recognize Okay, i got to fix something. And thank God for his word that we get to do that. So, 
We can do religious activities and not get a single thing done. Activity is not the end game. Getting something done is. And if you ever have felt like you're that hamster in the wheel when it comes to the things of God and just spinning your wheels, you are in great fortune coming today. So, what is that? Home plate. All right, well, what we're going to do today is there's one, and I've already alluded to it, there's really just one passage section of the Word of God, of Jesus' instruction, that is home plate today. As a matter of fact, not just in, in today's message, it, this needs to become home plate whenever you desire to experience anything in God. And by the way, it, it's go, I'm going to prove it to you, that like this is really important stuff. This needs to become home plate. So here we go. As they passed by in the morning, Mark 11, 20, 24, oh, can I please, as we also say regularly here, Please do not go, oh, I already know those verses. I've read every Kenneth Hagin book. I've read, and by the way, Kenneth Hagin didn't write Mark 11, 23, 24. Anyway, Jesus, okay, Mark, being told by Peter, wrote what Peter, through the Spirit, wanted documented about this event. Jesus said this, not Kenneth Hagin. And please don't do that because you're about to, you'll really miss something if you think, well, I already got that. Okay, well, I already got pilot's licenses and lots of types rating, but I'm learning every day. Okay, it's the same thing in spiritual things. So, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, and Jesus answered, before we keep going... The principles, and I wrote this down, I want you to, and, and I, please write this down. I was on the way into the church, and I, I, uh, and I spoke this into my phone because I didn't want to forget it. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is notice the fig tree, what happened to the fig tree was a result of what Jesus was going to teach, meaning that these powers do not only belong to you getting your bills paid and believing God. There's powers that are released through what he's about to talk about, and I want you to and write this down. Jesus did not die on the cross simply to make us nice. He died on the cross to make us powerful. His word, his spiritual technology, certainly has moral guidelines make no mistake. I mean, there's behaviors you're just going to have to have. But primarily, the Word of God is the open window. The curtain's been called back. Johnny, show them what you will show them behind. What's curtain number one? The Word of God is opened up so that, and I want us to see, notice, that what he's about to teach us didn't bless a tree at all. As a matter of fact, he cursed it and killed it. Gravity is not only for me to be here, to stand here. I mean, all sorts of stuff is dependent on the powers and the laws of what gravity is doing. Well, we're about to be taught specific laws that are much bigger than simply... But now, we're going to focus on prayer, but this is huge. He killed something applying these laws. Jesus killed something. Okay? Let's pay attention. The fig tree that you cursed has withered, and Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, say whoever. whoever. Say whoever. whoever. One more time, say whoever. whoever. Okay, whoever is one of those words, meaning not everybody's going to have this happen to them. You need to be a whoever. Amen. I'm a whoever. Are you a whoever? Yes. All right, was that you who said that, Joyce? I'm going to say I'm a whoever. I'm learning today how to be a whoever. And I'm committing today to be a whoever. All right, you said it, not me. I just, you followed along. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but he believes that what he says will come to pass. He, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. So based on home plate, there's some just, I think it's four principles, five, four or five uh, principles, simple stuff. This is not deep, rev a deep revelation teaching where you leave here two hours later and your head's spinning. That's not what this is about. I want to help you. Like I said last week when I was talking about the crucified life, I wanted to take the mystery out of it so that I could help you. 
so that it, it, it became a, it, the message of the cross could be work, workable in your hands. Well, today I'm believing I'm going to help you. And that understanding faith, we're going to take the mystery out of it, and this is going to help you. Okay, so about four or five principles we're going to talk about. So, number one, the first, the, the first principle, the first law, the first instruction that we can glean from Mark eleven twenty three. 24, notice it says, whatever, say whatever, whatever you ask in prayer, meaning you've got to understand and do these things every time you pray. Every time. He said, whatever you ask in prayer. Now, what do you think whatever means in the Greek? Whatever. Whatever. So when he says, whatever you ask in prayer, and I'm helping some of you folks because while I'm ministering, I would suggest you start doing some inventories. Start doing some inventories of what you were doing when you thought you were praying. Jesus is saying, whatever you ask in prayer, meaning we've got to understand and do these things every time. Every single time. And I do, most of the time. Still human, but I've had some really great successes, and I can go back to, even if I was accidentally doing them, I was doing the things we're talking about today. You know, you could accidentally, like if I took a rock, a three-year-old kid can take a rock and throw it, and for a little while it's going to fly. He doesn't know all the laws of physics and stuff like that, but the thing flew. It worked. Well, I'm going to show you today on how, let's, how about we don't have prayer accidents and we become scientists in prayer. But it's going to start with, Jesus said, whatever you ask in prayer. So whatever we're about to study, you're going to do this every single time. If you didn't do it every single time, you could leave here now and you've just been helped. We must determine that in the same way there are specific steps to any accomplishment, prayer is no exception. Many of us will just plan on, we just say, oh, God's just going to take care of everything. God's just going to do it all. We're going to hit this here in a little bit. You know, I'm just, you know, let go. And maybe, no, I'm going to hold off because I addressed that whole let go and let God statement. That's caused a lot of problems. Clearly, that if, listen, if I decide that I need to get in shape and lower my blood pressure, Right? I'm not going to just stare out the window and think weight's going to lose. I'm going to, I'm going to adjust my diet. I'm going to make sure that uh, I, I'm doing my diet, I'm doing my exercise, and I'm going to work together with, well, the laws of the Spirit are the same thing. Whatever you ask in prayer. Let go and let God is incomplete on its own. Now, when we cast our cares, it's true. We cast our cares on the Lord. There is a letting go. God has a position. He has a responsibility, but he's still part of an equation. We're going to work. You, you cannot follow, let go, and let God unless you understand these principles. Point number two. So, number one, whatever you ask in prayer, you're going to do this. Number two. Have faith in God. Whatever we would want to accomplish, it's relying on resources, whatever resource is available. My, God, my friends, if God is your point of trust and nothing is impossible to him, then there are no impossible situations. Then there are no impossible situations. Meaning, but that's, okay, have faith, it starts, have faith, whatever you're going to do, have this, whatever these processes are, your faith, your focus... The, the, the bank account, so if I can use that, is not necessarily the best illustration, but where you're going to for resources is no one, nothing else but God himself. Now, that's an incredible license because there's a lot of the world today that still wonders whether God's even out there, let alone he can be, he'll favorably interact with them. We're already give, being given permission by God in the flesh to know you can have a one-on-one, -on -one, continual, forever interaction with the creator of the universe, and he, he's actually happy to have you do that with him. We are licensed. We have permission and with that permission, expectation to expect from God as long as we follow his principles and his laws. Have faith in God. That means the primary battle we are going to face 
is resisting getting our eyes on anything but God. See, here's the thing. Satan knows how the laws of the kingdom work. He, he, he knows. And he knows how much God loves people. So all he really has to do to botch things up is find out what God said about us and then go in there and try to get us to not think the way God thinks about us. So that means if that's the case, let's see if there's an example of what happened. Peter got out of the boat. This is a famous, famous account. Um, Matthew 14, 29, 31. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Well, thank God he's there to save us. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I'm submitting to you based on what we just read and what we're seeing. Doubt is a result of something. Like if you know how you get this thing called doubt, you can shut the doors to it. And I want to encourage, listen, we talked a little bit earlier about seasons in the Lord and, and uh, how things work. And, you know, look, I'll, I'll fast and pray just as much as anybody else. But did you know there's also verses in there about leading quiet and peaceable lives? If you spend your entire life fasting and praying and having no joy and no rest in your life, you're going to be out of balance and the Lord's not necessarily going to endorse it. Now, I said that to say, make no mistake. His children are meant at specific times to walk on water. He will call you out of that boat. There will be nothing to save you except for him. And by the way, it's to your benefit and to his glory that he calls you onto the boat. I would suggest that, listen, go ahead and account. Be a faithful steward. Do your budgets. But if you don't think for one second there isn't going to be a time in your life, your family, your ministry where God's going to say, uh, right now you're going to throw away your budget. Because I'm asking you to do something that is impossible. Peter, forget your life preserver. Yeah, you're right, it's me, and I'm going to prove it. Come on out. We are designed to walk on water. Now, where we get out of balance is thinking we get to walk on water all the time, and we ignore natural principles, and that's in the ditch just as much as anything else. But see, this is important. We understand this because you're going to have a time. We are, we are created for his pleasure. And how many times have you heard through 25 years, 24, 25 years in this church, that God is not looking for what's humanly possible. He didn't design us to watch what's humanly possible. What he designed us is, to see, is for us to experience what's possible with him in and through us. When I posted that uh, comment about Reinhard Bunke, and you'll hear people say, wow, what an amazing man of God. There's no such thing as, listen to me, and there's preachers that should be hearing this. There's no such thing as an amazing man of God. But what there is, is an amazing God through a man. There's no, Bunky was not an amazing man of God. But his God was amazing. And he, and, and, and if we know what's on the menu, then we ought to be going, well, me too. If, that, if, if seeing something, like just watch that video in, in Lagos, Nigeria, of three, over three million people came to Christ in that crusade. Three million people. That's not humanly possible. But an amazing God, my friends, you are, at some point, he's going to call you out. And it's going to be him. It's going to be unmistakable. It's going to scare the daylights out of you. But you better get your rear end out of the boat because you're about to miss something so amazing that God wants to do through you. And I would suggest we understand these principles. So he got called out of the boat. Lord, save me. He did. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Well, we know why he doubted. When he saw the wind, have faith in God. He had faith in God and his Lord when he came out. But seeing the distractions, now all of a sudden the winds and the wave caused him to see his humanity instead of the lordship of, of, the, of, of his Christ and his Savior. And what happened is that's when he began to sink. My friends... The number one battle you and I are going to, outside of ignorance, is this drawing to get your eyes off of having faith in God. And that leads us to number three. Do not doubt in your heart. So here we have 
a demonstration of how doubt got there. Okay, number three, what, number one, you're going to have to do this for everything. All right, number two, faith in God. Number three, let's not have doubt in our heart. Watch what Paul, the Apostle Paul said here in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We destroy, say destroy. Okay, is that a pretty word? No, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, certainly the bigger picture was he was dealing with a bunch of knuckleheads that were coming against him, his church, and his authority. But notice what he said about taking every thought captive. That means every thought. Say every. Say every. Okay, what do you think every means in the Greek? Yeah, every. Some of you... Actually, all of us, but some of you are going to have to get a whole lot better putting a lasso around how your, where your brain goes and start throwing that stuff in jail. And at the beginning, he says, arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. In other words, the knowledge of God we find primarily through the scriptures and then, of course, the experiences we're having with him and the testimonies that we're building up. Well, there are things that are going to come against that, and we have to understand destruction and captivity when it comes to how our brains are working because they are there to get our eyes off of having faith in God and into anything else. Take 10 seconds and ask yourself whether you effectively have a wrecking ball in your brain that knows how to instantly shut things down when they're wrong. We're going under. We're never going to make it. Nobody loves me. No one's using me. They'll Walter. And see, here's the thing. Those thoughts, they grow. They grow. And here's the thing. When the strongholds are built, you become blind to the very things that God's designing and trying to do with you. And our minds, and and today, and uh, unequivocally, the Word of God is clear, not Just because you think something doesn't mean that's the way God made you. If there's thoughts I've got to destroy and throw into jail and not allow them, that takes away. And then we talked about the fruit of the Spirit last week. If one of the the last one in there is self control, self control, taking thoughts captive means there's going to be things that are going to come into your brain. There's passions that are going to want to come alive. They have absolutely no business coming alive in you. We're not wanton beings to do whatever our passions and emotions feel like. I would start working on that one if, if I were you. And I am you. And I have, and I'm getting better at it. I'm not perfect at it. But preachers aren't, you know, immune to these things. Even Jesus. Jesus could not have been tempted in the wilderness if he wasn't literally being tempted. And so our thoughts, and understand, remember, what was principle number one? Whatever you ask in prayer, do not doubt is something you're going to have to decide you're not going to do every time you pray about every single situation you pray about. I'm helping you. Head doubt is not the same as heart doubt. But uncaptivated thoughts eventually lead to heart doubt. What happens, you'll sit, and it's easy for the devil to get into your head and go, oh my, man, I'm just, I'm not sure if this is going to happen. I'm not sure. I'm not, God. you're not doubting. That's not, that, that's not heart doubt. That wants to get into your heart, those thoughts. This is why, we're, if every thought was okay, then we wouldn't be told to smash the thing, destroy it, and take it captive. <clears throat> so what happens is, learn this. There's always going to be, the, the, remember, the, the thief comes immediately to steal, kill, steal, kill, and destroy. In the parable of the sower, what's the devil do? He comes immediately to steal the word of God. All right, when those things happen, those assaults in your brain come, that is not uh, the unbelief and doubt in his heart he's talking about. That's being tempted to get into unbelief. You're being tempted to look at the winds and the waves. But what happens is if you smash those thoughts, if you destroy them, if you throw those things in jail, they don't have a chance to get into your heart to where you let go of what it is you've already received from God. 
And there's folks that get condemned, and, and, and the devil will be right there to sit there and say, well, look at this, look at that. And you start looking, and you go, oh, my gosh, now I'm in unbelief. And then you start playing ping pong back and forth in yourself in your head. And then you get confused, everyone around you gets confused, and you end up just making a mess everywhere. Understand that there's a head doubt. The temptation to doubt is not the same as letting things go. So see those things. When you're tempted to look at uh, circumstances that are against what you can believe for, you need to see them as your sworn enemy. And I'm telling you, every time I've seen this stuff work, we've had to do this. I've had to do this. Four, almost done. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. That means... Whether you're praying for your cold and flu and all the families are out today and you're believing God and you've prayed about it, whatever you ask in prayer, you have to do this. Or whether it's thinking you're going into the heavenlies to bind principalities. No, you're not, by the way. There's a teaching out there about intercessory prayer. I'm going to deal with it right now. There is no such thing as an allegiance to another minister that releases more power in your prayer. It's your allegiance to Jesus of Nazareth in his name that releases power. You don't need to get a group of people around some apostle. And because we're in allegiance with that apostle, we're going to have more power in prayer. That is dead wrong. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe it. There's been revivals throughout history. It had nothing to do with alignment with an apostle and principalities and everything, but it had old ladies on their knees pleading and praying to God and thanking them that he's hearing their prayer. And sometimes the most crazy stuff comes into the teaching of intercessory prayer, and it just gets way out there. And what happens in some of it is we keep coming up with new stuff because the old stuff didn't work because you weren't doing the whatever in prayer. So we got to come up with new things. It must be some big prince. It must be some big principality. No, I miss some meals. Get in here. Start speaking the word of God. Thanking God. The moment he said or we prayed that the streets are filled with worshipers, they're filled. And a principality's not going to stop me. He's not blocking my way to heaven, too. The scriptures are clear in the book of Hebrews. We've talked about this before. There's no such thing as entering his courts with praise anymore. Not to the New Testament believer. You instantly are in the Holy of Holies. If I'm in union with Christ, seated with him, how's the principality in my way? Stop the nonsense. And the last time I checked, when Daniel, he didn't even know what was going on. Daniel wasn't fighting principalities. God took care of that. Daniel was just being faithful with what God told him to do. How about we get back to just being faithful with what God said. He deals with his stuff. We deal with ours. And if you're worried about spiritual warfare, well, we got to go into heaven. You want spiritual warfare? Go on the streets and start telling people about Jesus. You'll have all the spiritual warfare you ever wanted. The streets are filled with worshipers, not because a principality is going to get out of the way. It's because there's time. Did you know the scriptures say, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. There's times and seasons of holding on. But I'm not praying because it's going to get it to happen. I'm thanking him because it's mine. I've seized it. There's those in this church. We've seized this. And no flipping principality is going to get in my way. Stop that. By the way, it's a whole lot easier to go after a principality than turn off your computer at 3 in the morning, too. Or maybe a list of five other things he's probably dealing with you in your flesh about. You think you're going to run around and go deal with him when he's watching what you're doing at 2 and 3 in the morning? Or how you're treating your wife or your kids? It's all distractions. Get some faith. And believe God. There's a reason specifically why I went down that road. And my church is not going to be taken off into that stuff. I cannot endorse a prayer movement that depends on allegiance to some apostle somewhere.
And you'll get done with your yelling and screaming and everything like that, and the world will still be the same until you get a hold of what does the Word of God say, and you hold on to the Word of God, and you'd rather take a bullet in your forehead to believe that you have to get something when you've already seized it in the Spirit, and it's yours. Do not endorse following apostles and being in allegiance with apostles to get more power. Do not agree with that at all. If you want to pray, you want to trust God for revival, you go ahead. But once a man, once an office starts exalting himself, listen, I've known genuine apostles and prophets, and the last thing they really cared about is what you were called about. They would rather just sit there and talk to you and just fellowship with you, and they'd rather exalt Jesus. And the last thing they would do is align with me because that'll give you more power. Stop playing around with this stuff. stop. And that's going to be important because starting next year, elections are coming up and stuff like that. We'll get back our midweek prayer services and stuff like that. And Let's do what we're supposed to do. And that's just speak the word of God. Speak the word of God. Believe God. Trust God. Through thick and thin, there's, I, I, we're blessed to have Arthur Butt here today. Amen. Arthur, how long have you been serving in New England? 45 years. Okay. That's where your revivals are found, not in one prayer meeting. But people that dig their roots in. All right. Were you always well known, Arthur? Okay. Well, you kind of are. Okay. No, but through whether it's his business, serving other ministries, pastoring, and now Andy's Andy's now full time over there now. He's the pastor, right? Yeah. Okay. That's where we're gonna find it. That's where we're going to find it. And you know what? If Moses had his rear end shoved out in the middle, Moses caused a deliverance of an entire nation. All right? And God didn't have him running with principalities and powers. He learned how to be in allegiance with God. And God straightened him out where he needed to, and he went and he did his job, and then God did amazing things. And instead of looking after principalities and powers, Jonas and John Bray showed up, and then God showed up and choked the life out of those serpents and got rid of them. Instead of looking for devils, I think I just want to rejoice in the presence of my God. And stop this old covenant teachings and beliefs of all these processes. I'm in union with God. The writer of Hebrews consistently, continually said, we have access boldly by faith into the holiest of holies. There's no gates. It doesn't exist to a New Testament believer. We don't do that. We keep trying to apply all of these things and these principles from back then. It doesn't work. I've said enough. What is settled in God's mind must be settled in yours. If I've believed, I've received, well, the moment I do that, the moment I believed, I received, remember, whatever I ask for in prayer. That's why I keep saying the streets are filled with, uh, with worshipers and the place is filled with the power of God because I've received it. I don't care whether you see it or not. I have it. I have it. It's mine. Amen to that. See, there's something that gets inside faith. It gets, it's the, it's the evidence and the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence means you have it. Okay, and one more thing. I'll go back. A lot of these movements split up too many churches. They split them up. Because people get very... And I, there's a reason why I posted on Facebook the other day. Stop thinking that if it's weird, it must be God. And it's like the, the more mystical things get, the more it must be God. No. No. And just like some other things some of you are familiar with, I've never, ever one time seen this stuff produce, stuff that lasts. And, by the way, grow the local church. It grows tangents. It grows groups and tangents. 
But the local church many times suffers for it because the pastor's not spiritual enough. The leadership is too controlling. Pastor Joe's too controlling today. Do you hear how he's talking about that stuff? I'm trying to save you some effort and get back to the Word of God. We don't need new revelation. We need to be faithfulness in what we were given in the Word of God. I don't need a new revelation. He's given me, it is written. In New England, we genuinely need an outpouring of God. Let's not go after fringe stuff. Let's go old school, go back to how Jesus did it and Paul did it. It's not new revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation, uh, of, uh, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him is a result of opening up the word of God, not creating this new thing that's going to come out today. I'm trying to help you guys. Some of the stuff is starting to it's happening again. It's another round, and the local church, including ours, will end up losing folks over it. Watch me. Watch it. Because it comes in, the pastor doesn't understand. He's not spiritual enough. When, you know what shepherds do? They protect sheep. Okay, we're wired to make sure you stay within the pen, because outside there's things that are going to get you in trouble. And if you want to learn how to pray and intercede, I've got a list this long of people that I know and can have learned to trust. And if this is in our junk drawer, let's, let's go after how Brother Hagen taught how to pray. Let's go after how Smith Wigglesworth and John Lake taught how to pray. They never talked about any of this stuff. But boy, they got things done, didn't they? One of the things I've learned in the last year and a half is not let stuff come into my church that I don't agree with. I love you guys too much. And I want the streets filled with worshipers. And I want you distracted. I don't want it. And names come and names go and fads come and fads go. Miss some meals, pray in tongues. And wait on God to give you a word. You know what? You don't need anything more than that. What did the Apostle Paul say? Now I can get off of it. He says, what's happening to you? How has the devil come in through his guile and caused you to leave the simplicity of Christ? The more layered the stuff gets with mysticism and weirdness, the more you ought to flee from it like you would the plague. Lastly, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. How many times do you have there? Three times. <clears throat> what do you see to the right? It's, tight, it's a gauge, right? Pressure gauge. Tight. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The number one gauge, wherever you're at in God, you're going to find out, what are you talking about? If I'm in the room with you 30 minutes, I can tell you exactly where you're at in holiness. I'll tell you exactly where you're at with other people. You can say whatever you want outside of this. I just got to sit there and listen. And see, it's not the time for the lesson today because I didn't want to teach long. It's coming up on 11.30. Let's be done today. I got to go at this another week. Okay, But once we understand that words release spiritual power. Words release, and and I've used the illustration before, I can go, or I can get a fan, or I can get a jet engine. All three are expelling, making air move, but the potential to move something is a whole lot stronger coming out of a jet engine than it is even the fan and even the breath. The more you, the, the, the more you grow in your ability to flex faith, when you speak, the more is released. This is why you see, uh, uh, especially ministers, and there's, you can be healed and experience power as a believer, as a citizen, or you can be part of the government of God and have an office that he endows with some. And that's why there are those, and you listen, whether it's John Lake, Wigglesworth, John Lake talked about it, Billy Burke now, who's moving in miracles, they are very clear what they had at the end of their ministry was not the same as they had at the beginning. You grow and you develop. 
And Billy Burke, and you see these incredible miracles. But he talks about the miracles. He, <coughs> I saw about six months ago, I saw one of his meetings, and he was rejoicing that now he's up to about 30% of the people he prays for gets healed. Now here's a guy with a genuine office. You pull up Billy Burke and you watch them. There's this one lady on it. She's completely deaf and blind, and right in front of the cameras, Everything comes back together. Uh, organs are reappearing, a whole bunch of stuff. And, and you think these guys are doing it all the time. Listen, Arnold Schwarzenegger did not bench 500 pounds the first day. Well, it's the same thing in spiritual development. In spiritual development. And, as when we, and, and the more we develop in our abilities and clasping... Under the word of God, when we speak, it's imperative. When Jesus, when that fig tree withered, he released the spiritual energy that was on, it, on the inside of him. When he spoke it, that potential, that, that jet engine power came out of what was in him as potential. Uh, what's the, it'll, a capac- if you guys know what a capacitor is, once you hit that thing and it just releases everything it's stored, when we speak... What, happen, what you have stored, and whether it's a whisper or whether it's a jet engine, when you speak, the capacitor releases that energy out into the situation. That's how it works. That's the science of it. There's a reason why Jesus is called the Word of God. And he is the fullest expression, none diminished, in the, the, not just the image, but the, the inherent potential and power of the Father. And the Father released who he is through a word, whose name is Jesus. This last step in walking with faith is you're going to have to guard your mouth. You're going to have to guard your mouth. You have to be careful. Well, I'm in faith. We're going under. Everybody hates me. No one likes me. No one's. That's the abundance of your heart. And I'll tell you what, last thing you're releasing is spiritual power. You're going to have to understand it. So, one of the things we learned today no exceptions. What do you think? What's that number one mean? Why would I say no exceptions? In other words, whatever you ask in prayer, there's no exceptions. Whatever you ask. Now, this is not relationship prayer. Uh, you know, to, hey, Dad, hey, how you doing up there? How are things going? You doing all right? I just want you to know I love you. I just want you. I mean, you have to believe you're he's, he's listening to you. But whatever you ask with requests and prayer, there's no exceptions. You're going to do this. Focus, Daniel Sod. What do you think? That, what was number two? Okay, that's right. Having faith in God and nothing else. Don't let anything distract you. Uh, no doubt about it. What do we talk about the kinds of doubt? What, 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 talk to me about doubt for a minute. What did we talk about when it came to that? What are a couple principles? That's right. Just because you're thinking something, the winds and the waves, he acknowledged them. Okay, but what's the, how, does, how, does, how do those things get into heart doubt to where, okay, now you're, you're in trouble? That's right. Absolutely. You start seizing them. The winds and the waves now become more of the reality than what is. That means, you guys, you're go- there's going to be times you're going to pace your floor and you're going to go la, 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 la at everything that's screaming at you. And you're going to have to do this. Okay? Don't think I haven't heard la, 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 la when it comes to street being filled with worshipers. Because there's all sorts of gimmicks to build a church. You can do all sorts of things. Listen, I can bring, I can bring Elvis in here and trust me, the seats will be full. Especially since he's supposed to be dead. <laughs> I'll have a full church, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to saturate in the power of God. Well, I suppose he would if it was really him and he was dead and finally came back. Well, there might be something there. Maybe that wasn't a good illustration. Um, Eddie Van Halen could be here. And I'd fill it up, maybe not with you guys, but. <laughs> Just because you can fill a building doesn't mean they're there for the right place. Let's have a plate. And listen, you can't fake the stuff I'm talking about. And if you don't think in 30 years of ministry, 25 here, that the voices aren't, no, come on, there's other ways to build. There's other, come on, try. And again, we were talking about earlier today, identi- our identity is if for 100 people, 100, whatever it is, for another 50 years, one day the ceiling is going to zip open and they're in a principality in the universe that's going to stop that. Because I didn't resist them over some yada running around with a, a horn. 
I resisted him through 20, we resisted him through 25, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years of taking whatever he could throw at us, and we still wouldn't let go of the altar. That's what's going to defeat him. He's beaten by our faithfulness to not let go of the altar. Not one service. Pound it out. What was that one? Destroy. Every taking captive every thought. Don't let your mind just be a wrecking ball to unbelief and things that want to come against the Word of God. No, it's a done deal. Believe you've received, and you'll have it. Or finally, your words are the gauge to where you're at. Selah. Did you learn something today? Okay, let's keep it simple, folks. Keep it simple. Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His Word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.